For many reasons, when you hear the name Bob Ballard, you might think of the discovery of the Titanic. But forgive me for this, but that's just the tip of the iceberg. <laughs> there are the other discoveries of shipwrecks like the Bismarck, the Lusitania, and the PT-109. There is the pioneering development of remote submersibles and telepresence that have escalated undersea exploration exponentially. There's also the discovery of hydrothermal vents on the floor of the ocean that could eventually be a source of food and energy. Most profoundly, there is Bob Ballard's restless enthusiasm for discovery and adventure and the commitment to creating the oceanic exploration version of the Lewis and Clark expedition. Bob has lived such an incredibly big life that our time with him today can barely cover the breadth of it, but we will try and at least will motivate you to read his memoir, Into the Deep, a memoir from the man who found Titanic. His other less known, less well-known claim to fame is being an incredible friend and neighbor to RJ Joya booksellers aided and abetted by Barbara Ballard, who is one of our very best customers. So with uh, that brief introduction, Bob, welcome to Just the Right Book. Well, thank you so much for having me, Roxanne. It's lovely to be on the land for a few minutes. I just uh, red-eyed back from my ship of exploration, the EV Nautilus, that just came in moments ago to get some uh, fresh milk and eggs as it heads back to sea. But we'll wow. talk about that later in the program. Yeah, well, we definitely will. So, Bob, when you dreamt of becoming an explorer as you were growing up in San Diego and spurred on by the character of Captain Nemo from 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, what do you think you thought then an explorer would be or do? Well, as you know from reading the book that I'm, I'm dyslexic, and so I, uh, I actually didn't know I was dyslexic till very late in life when my daughter, Emily Rose, was diagnosed when she was to the country school. And I was 62 years old and I learned about my dyslexia. I knew I was wired differently, that's for sure. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, I, I fell in love with the ocean when I was in San Diego, but I always like to joke that I was born in Wichita, Kansas, where all oceanographers come from. And I was born just six months after Pearl Harbor. And my father, who was an engineer building bombers at the time, uh, B-52 bombers, packed up the family and off we went to California. And before I knew it, I was staring out at this unbelievable ocean, the Pacific Ocean that covers a third of the planet. And clearly I never thought that this kid from Kansas would be on this show right now talking to you about 62 years of exploration. Uh, but it's been an amazing journey. It's been one that's uh, uh, had all sorts of great adventures. And that's why I, I really wanted to write this book because I felt, you know, I, 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 I'm 79 and, and most people talk about retiring. And I read the wrong definition in Webster's Dictionary. When I went in there, I read that, that halfway through the Indianapolis 500, the drivers go into the pit and they get a new set of tires and that's called retiring. So that's the one I'm going on. So even though this is my autobiography, rumors of my death are greatly exaggerated as fellow Connecticut Mark Twain once said. Yeah. So. So, Bob, I want to go back to it and spend at least a couple of minutes on uh, the subtitle of the book and uh, what we what we know as a big part of your exploration. And so one of the things I was fascinated by is after you learn that submarines were at the forefront of our efforts to avert nuclear warfare, and were engaged by the Navy to explore the accidental loss of two nu nuclear submarines, the Scorpion and the Thresher. 
I was fascinated by the fact that you managed to lever leverage that assignment <laughs> into convincing the Secretary of the Navy and maybe even President Reagan that if they would let you add on trying <laughs> to discover the Titanic, that you would actually, that the United States could actually play a brain game with the Soviet Union so that discovering the Titanic could help the U.S. win the Cold War. Now, that's a lot of words I just used, but it cracked me up to read how you, you know, you always wanted to discover the Titanic. Obviously, that takes a lot of money. And here you are getting hired by the Navy. Now, how would you manage to get them to, like, fall for that? Well, you know, a great question, you know, and, and I must say one of the wonderful things about writing the book is, you know, I was a, a, a Cub Scout, a Boy Scout, an Explorer Scout. I went on to become a combat infantry officer uh, during the Vietnam War and then moved over into the Navy. And I was always told to tell the truth. On my honor, I will do my best to do my duty. And I learned all of that. And then so it really was ironic that I would find the Titanic and that would be a cover for a military operation that you just mentioned and then not be able to tell the truth. So it's really wonderful. I'm fessing up now. But yeah. yeah, I don't think I would be sitting here talking to you about finding the Titanic had it not ironically been located between the Thresher and the Scorpion was the Titanic in the middle. And as you know, uh, or may not know, and but certainly the book talks about it, particularly the Scorpion. When we lost the Scorpion, it went down with all hands, but it also carried nuclear weapons to the bottom of the ocean. And you know, we don't like leaving those around. And so my mission, I was also living this dual life as a Naval Intelligence Officer. And when I met with Secretary Lehman, actually, he'll tell you the story. I invited him to go down diving in my submarine, Alvin. And we were down at 6,000 feet. And I said, so you want to go home after the dive, right? He said, of course. They said, well, not unless you let me go after the Titan. We had this great discussion at 6,000 feet. And he laughed and Laxip laughed about it, but he then, unknowing to me, and I didn't know this till we actually, uh, my co-author, uh, Chris Drew, who wrote the seminal book, Blind Man's Bluff, went and interviewed Lehman that he said, actually, he went and it was, it was President uh, Reagan who made the decision to let me do it. I didn't know it at the time, and I didn't know it until we, we were writing the book that it came straight out of the Oval Office from President Reagan, who wanted to send a message to the Soviets that if you think we're we're good, well, if we're if he if I can go inside the Titanic, uh, then we we must have amazing technology. And in fact, what they didn't know is I also went inside the Scorpion. So yes, it was a message to the Soviet Union, but. We needed to make sure they didn't put a satellite on me because if I told the world I was going to the Scorpion and going inside the Scorpion to look for its weapons, they would put a, they would track me. And so we needed a cover and Ray Reagan thought it was a great, in fact, he later after I found the Titanic invited me to that amazing a dinner at the White House with the Prince and Princess of Lady Di and Prince Philip uh, to to further show off America's prowess, so yeah, that was pretty cool. I mean, uh, I was I was able to do both, which was a lot of fun. And and Bob, what was the key to discovering the Titanic? Obviously, others had been doing it. In fact, France was on the uh, was a little bit ahead, and you ended up with a partnership with them, but. But what technology and what what set of luck or circumstances do you think was key to that discovery in 1985? I think it's because of the way dyslexics think. I, uh, as you mentioned, the French were actually the ones that were supposed to find the Titanic. And I was supposed to come in with my camera systems and film it, and yet they failed. So here I had this expedition. 
I knew I had to go out and do the scorpion without anyone knowing it. But then I knew that as soon as I got the green light, I had embedded in my team, unbeknownst to the French, unbeknownst to my own team, I had embedded three intelligence uh, officers, two of which were, were women. And as you know, the chauvinistic world, they thought, well, they were just secretaries or something. They were intelligence officers who were determining whether I did my job or not, and then let me gave me the green light. And so I, I only had 12 days to find the Titanic. And, I, and I'm thinking, well, how am I going to find the Titanic when all I have is a camera? I mean, in pitch black darkness, the French were supposed to find it with their sonar, which can search much broader areas and do what we call mow the lawn. And so my brain got going and I discovered the key defining the Titanic by mapping the scorpion. Because here's what happened. When the scorpion imploded tragically, uh, it was in 11,500 feet of water, but once it passed collapse depth way above, it just went off like a bomb and all of the parts of the scorpion came raining down on the ocean floor. And my orders from my commanding officer, who was Vice Admiral Ron Thunman, who was Assistant Secretary of the Navy for Submarine Warfare at the time, said, Commander, I want you to give me 100% coverage of the Titanic's, I mean, of the Scorpion's debris field, because I want to see the whole ball game, because they still want to try to figure out what sank it. And I, I thought, well, they had all fell down. There would be a big pile of stuff down there. And I would then simply go back and forth until I'd done 100% of it. So I, I started naturally beyond where it was where it was. So I started on normal ocean floor and then I drove towards the site. We knew where it was. And as I crossed it, it was like crossing a line and then it was wreckage everywhere. And then I came out the other side. So I got the, the south end, the north end. Then I came around and came in on the east end thinking I would immediately come out of the west end forming a circle. It, mm -hmm. wasn't, it was a giant comet. It went on and on and on and on for over a mile. And I looked at it and then being, you know, being a physicist, I could see that it was a perfect, what we call uh, debris field is a function of density. So clearly the heavy objects like the nuclear reactors and the pressure hulls sank like a bowling ball, but the lighter material was carried by the undersea currents and was a fallout. And I went, wait a minute, the Titanic must have done the same thing. We knew it broke in half. It would have acted like giant salt shakers, but I'll bet you it has a debris field that is same length. And so instead of looking for the Titanic, I, went around, I could space my lines widely apart and search for the debris field. It was sort of like if you wanted to photograph a deer in the winter, you look for their footprints and you follow the footprints. So I looked for the footprints of the Titanic. Hmm. I found it and walked right in. But so I Bob, didn't tell what, anyone how I got this brilliant what, idea. Bob, when I was reading that, it it confused me. So I read how, you know, the exploration of the scorpion helped you understand the role of the debris trail, which is yeah. the language you used in the book, but what was confusing to me, so I'm assuming it might be confusing to other people, is I would think it would be easier to find a big dense mass than try to find a debris trail. Why is it easier to find a debris trail? Well, the Titanic's only 90 feet wide. The debris feels a mile long. Oh. So imagine again, the deer hiding gotcha. in the woods. The deer is just relatively small compared to all its footprints. And I used it to find the Bismarck. I used it to find it. It was, became my Rosetta Stone mm -hmm. discovery. Why well, I was able to discover so many things other people hadn't discovered. And it's just the way we dyslexics visualize things in our mind where we can, I work, beautifully well in total darkness. <laughs> I'm not lost. <laughs> Bob, one of the things that um, was that you described so vividly is 
in the instances when you've been in one of the submergibles, which, which has been key, another key element to the discoveries that you've done. So, you know, there's the Argo, the Angus. Describe for us the size of these things. How many people are in them? How are they situated? How long are you in it? Because that that struck me as wild. These, yeah. you know, it, it, it is. Uh, uh, it depends. See, I've been diving for a million years, and I've dove in real submarines, nuclear submarines. I've dove in a very special submarine the Navy built, uh, right at New, uh, operated out of New London called the NR1, which was the smallest nuclear submarine ever built. And it's quite honestly and ironically a modern version of Captain Nemo's Nautilus. It's a, it has wheels, it can run on the bottom, it has windows, you can see outside. What and size is it, Bob? That that's one? about a, well, the pressure hull is that you can operate in is about uh, 40 feet. But the one I spend most of my time in was when I was at Woods Hole for 30 years was a submarine called Alvin. And Alvin was like diving in a Swiss watch. I mean, I'm 6'2", and the pressure sphere is less than, it's six feet. So when I stood up, I'd hit my head on the on the hatch. That's why I lost all my hair. I <laughs> tore it off on the hatch. But anyway, it's only six foot diameter with three people in it. So it's for some people that are, you don't want to do this if you're claustrophobic. But quite honestly, it's I don't feel claustrophobic in, in the in little submarines because it has a window. And when I look out the window, I realize it's far safer where I am. I suspect that if it, my, my deep diving submersibles didn't have windows, I'd feel claustrophobic, but uh, uh, I don't. I, I can look out the window and see, but they're very, very tiny. Yes. And I typically go down in them, you spend the day down there. Uh, and that's why I, as you read further into the book, I, I talk about mankind's quest to, to work in the deep sea. And initially we did it with our bodies because we could, that's the only way we could do it. But now I have right over here, a complete view of what my ship is doing right this second. And we'll show you the website later on, but you don't have to physically go down anymore. Uh, we're air breathing animals and we don't really like that. And I now can send a robot in my place and it's called telepresence. It's beaming my spirit, which is indestructible and can move at the speed of light instead of my frail body, which is can get killed. And after 25 years of almost being killed <laughs> numerous times, I thought, you know, there's a better way of going to work. And that's when I dreamed up again with my dyslexic mind, another way of going to work, which is what I'm doing now. And, and Bob, what circumstances now would you have a person in a submersible versus the telepresence? Any? None. 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 Well, here's simple math. The average depth of the ocean is 12,000 feet, which is the Titanic is at. To get to just the average depth, when I dove on the Titanic, it took me two and a half hours to get to work in the morning and two and a half hours to get home at night. So my daily commute to work was five hours. Well, in an eight hour day, if you're gonna do it the night, you're talking about three hours on the, when I dove to 20,000 feet, it was six hours each way. Well, I have minutes on the bottom. What the robot lets you do with yeah. fiber optics is go down and stay down. When, when Hercules, it's, it's the one you're going to be able to watch when you go to nautiluslive.org. That's our website. It's live right this second. It'll be live till Christmas, 24 hours a day. When you go down with the robots, you leave them down. And it's sort of like beam me down, Scotty. Yeah. And you just send your spirit. And that's where we're headed. I'm working still a lot with the Navy. And the, and the warfare of the future is the war of robots. Uh, this is a war of robots. And where the human is, well... Where in in, in 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 with the use of drone warfare, uh, the operators in New Mexico, they're not in the battlefield, but they're operating a drone in the in the battlefield. Well, that's happening underwater. The Navy of the future, you'll never see, and it'll be operated by people somewhere. And we're mm -hmm. working on that technology as we speak. 
Uh, Bob, one of the things that was uh, among, uh, there are a number of very poignant uh, moments in the book, and we'll get to at least a couple of them, but I was very struck by um, your reaction in the moment that you realized you had discovered the Titanic. Share with us how that felt and what you did. That was very surprising. You have to understand that you know, I'm a scientist and I saw the Titanic as a quest. I saw it as a cover for military. I was not emotionally attached to the Titanic. I wasn't a kid that when I was growing up just, you know, couldn't get enough Titanic. Uh, I, 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 I wasn't that, you know, caught up in it until I found it. And that was quite surprising because it's sort of like, uh, my family, I'm 13th generation American, and I had family members on both sides of Pickett's Charge at the Battle of Gettysburg. And every American should go to Gettysburg and say, never, never again do we want another civil war, because every casualty was an American. And particularly in my family, one more blue and one more gray. The yeah. ground speaks to you. And it wasn't so much the Titanic as a ship. It was being at the spot. It was being at uh, going to the Arizona and Pearl Harbor. Being at a place where the ground speaks to you and it spoke and, and it really blew me away. I was deeply affected by it. And that's why I said, I will never, ever take anything from this site. Never did. And were you surprised at the media onslaught that it, had you, had yeah. it not dawned on you or had, you, had it not dawned on you that it would be at that level? I was, I mean, I was really ran over by a media truck. Now, fortunately, I'd made some seminal discoveries. I'd done TV shows with National Geographic. I'd done talk shows and all of that. But I, uh, this was at another level. This was like a feeding frenzy. Mm. And uh, I was ran over by a truck. And I'll, as you know, at the beginning of the book, uh, because as I said, I'm not only the uh, 13th generation American. I'm the first in my family to go to college. Uh, I've traced my roots back to Kansas and to eight year, eight generations of Quakers. And so it was my mother <laughs> who called because uh, I came back from finding the Titanic and naturally National Geographic had me on the Today Show, the Tonight Show, the Tomorrow Show, the Day <laughs> After Tomorrow Show. It was a media frenzy and I finally got home and the phone rang and there's my mom and she said we saw you on all the shows but you know it's too bad you found that rusty old ship because you're a great scientist you've made seminal discoveries but now they're only going to remember you for that rusty old boat and mm. you know moms are always right so yeah it's been an interesting duality in my life because I am very proud to be a very accomplished scientist who's made really critical discoveries. The discovery of hydrothermal vents uh, with the origin of life on our planet, a guide to finding life elsewhere in the universe. That's pretty cool. We rewrote the book when we proved the theory of plate tectonics. We wrote, rewrote the biology book with hydrothermal vents. We rewrote the, the chemistry book with the discovery of, of black smokers and the circulation system, system inside our planet. We've done some amazing stuff. And it's all in the book, but I'm sure people are going to initially buy it when we when they were going to do a title. They they said they had to put the man who found the Titanic on the cover, and I went, "All right, okay." As long and, as there's other stuff in there. Well, you know, Bob, one of the things that um, seems to have been a tension that you're referring to is, you know, you're not only an incredibly educated scientists, but as, as you just said, the amount of complicated, complex, physics-based, scientifically-based discoveries are enormous, yet you 
or in your 30 years at Woods Hole, uh, you know, did battle for part of that time with, was his name John Steele? Well, yeah, I think it's really interesting because I knew uh, that if, uh, you know, I, 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 my, one of my role models was Carl Sagan, who I thought was a brilliant scientist at Princeton, uh, who brought so much fascination of science to the general public, and he was punished for it. He was punished for it. He was punished for it. He was not admitted to the National Academy of Science. Uh, he was punished. And yeah, I, I, I knew that because I, you know, when I found the Titanic, uh, I, I'd already gotten tenure because I knew I couldn't go after it until I'd, I'd proved myself as an academician. And I knew what I had to do. And I knew that I had to outpublish all my peer groups by times four. So mm. a typical research scientist publishes one referee in a referee journal, uh, which is not an easy thing. It's a lot of work to publish a, a major piece of science in a referee journal. And the average at Woods Hole was one. I did four and I needed to be the senior authors. So I knew I would be punished unless I could hold myself academically to extremely high level, uh, which I did. And, and I still do, I still publish in referee journals, but yeah, it's interesting. But now this, it's changed a little. I must say the present generation of scientists uh, know that they need to communicate better with the public because science is paid for by the public. And I feel unless you go to the taxpayer and convince them that their investment in your work is worth doing, then you shouldn't be funded. And as you know, I'm in a whole new adventure now, which we'll talk about at some point, mounting the second Lewis and Clark expedition, although it's really not the second Lewis and Clark expedition because my team has 55% women. I'm calling it the Lewis and Clark expedition. So I- Lewis and Clark expedition was 33% women. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, it's Satchajawea and that was it. Carrie, and she had a baby with her while these other guys were rowing around. I mean, she had a baby with her and she saved them from being murdered by a tribe of, of Native Americans that the chief happened to be her brother. So what do you know? Or you wouldn't you know. know. Um, what I want to move on to that I think is so important for the future. Uh, uh, you know, I don't I mean, I was fascinated by the story of the PT-109 and your discovery about the Black Sea and the Phoenician ships and the trade routes. And so I don't want, I want everybody to understand that all of that is there and we'd be here all night. But here's a topic I'd like to spend a little bit of time on. You talk about that we currently have the capacity to harvest energy from the ocean, but only above the water, as is done in Iceland. But your research has discovered mountain ranges and volcanoes deep, deep um, on the seabed of the ocean, and that that process might eventually produce geothermal energy yeah. below the water. So share with us, how would that work? And what's going to, what is it going to take to tap that as a real energy source? Well, you, you have to realize that most people don't realize that the largest mountain range on earth is beneath the sea hmm. called the mid ocean Ridge, this giant mountain range covers 23% of the Earth's total surface area. And yet we went to the moon before a few of us ventured in this mountain range for the first time. We went to the moon before we went to the largest feature of our own planet. And running around the entire length of this mountain range, which stretches around the planet like the seam of a baseball, is 40,000 uh, miles, 70,000 kilometers of continuous active volcanoes. Think about it. There are tens of thousands Crazy. of active volcanoes and their magma chambers are a short distance below the surface. And the temperature of those is 12 to 14 
100 degrees centigrade. Talk about heat energy. We've also discovered all along the coast of the United States, tens of thousands of methane seeps, methane pouring out of the bottom of the ocean. We're now looking at how we as explorers can use those methane seeps as gas stations for our underwater robots. No, the energy that's within the earth is unbelievable. And, and this is why we're exploring the half of America. Think about it. 50% of the United States of America is beneath the sea. And we have better maps of Mars than half of the United States of America. And that's what I'm doing this very second as I look over the shoulder at my ship. It's out there mapping what we own. And we'll be doing it for the next nine years until we have a complete map of America. So I'm going to come back to that, but I can't help on given that today Jeff Bezos took an elevator ride up into space. So what's your reaction to what that 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 being basically a stunt? It's amazing what you can do when you're a billionaire. <laughs> I, I've got it. I'm a kid from Kansas and I'm responsible to the American people. And I want to explore half of my country to the benefit of the American people. So I'm, you know, it's great. I'm glad he did it. I hope everyone buys a ticket and goes up there. But I, I got a job to do. There's no plan B for yeah. the human race. We're here. We're not going to escape. Superman could have gone to Mars and wrote it off. There is no plan B for the human race. And unless we can come to grips with our planet and the life on it, it's, it's a new emerging uh, concept called the concept of Gaia, that Earth is actually a creature that is living symbiotically with all life on the planet, except for one species, and that's us. And if you think uh, the COVID-19 was a bad curveball, get ready for the next curveball thrown at us by our planet and life on our planet that's now declared war on the human race. Unless we make peace, we lose, they will win. There will be a planet in billions of years. There will be life on this planet in billions of years. A lot of people aren't betting on the human race will make it through this century mm. unless we change our ways. You know, you've got some statistics in the book, and I want to go back to the point uh, that you just made. So here are some facts that you have in the book that I think are worthy of sharing. U.S. owns more land underwater than any other nation on Earth. Three quarters of the planet is covered, of our planet is covered by water. 95% of all people live on less than 5% of the planet. The population is now 7.7 .7 billion. Earth can support 10.5 billion if they are all vegetarians. Which we're not. Which we're and not. We that number in, in 2050. So we hit that's the wall in 2050. So talk a little bit more because after I read that, after I read your book and I looked at these statistics, it sort of rearranged my brain. Not about the danger. Uh, you, can't, you can't be a, a reading human being and not understand the danger. But I don't think I ever really grasped the potential of solving many of our problems with oceanic exploration. So if you, if you had a magic wand, what would you have our country do tomorrow to accelerate what we can do to literally save the planet. We need to move away from being a primitive hunter gatherer of food in the sea. 1200 years ago, we domesticated sheep and goats, we cultivated crops, and we moved away from a hunter-gatherer society to a farming and herding society. We are presently going out there hunting the lions, the tigers, and the bears of the ocean. We're killing the top 
predators. We've killed 90% of all the large fish in the sea. We've hunted them down and killed them. Well, at that rate, they're gone. And top predators control the balance of the ecosystem. So we need to stop doing that and we need to become farmers and herders. There's a great project you can go on uh, YouTube and look at called the Valella Project. It's where- Spell that, Bob. V-E-L-L-E-L-A, Valella Project. It's off the big island of Hawaii. It's an amazing guy named uh, Neil Sims. When I was on the president's commission, I was selected by the president to serve with 15 other people to spend two years listening to 500 experts. And I went back to school and listened to them to write the blueprint for the 21st century for our country, which we did. When I was listening to those, I remember a, 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 an incident that occurred when I had a, a people who were doing open, uh, were doing aquaculture and environmentals, and they went at one another tooth and nail. And I asked them to start acting like adults and calm down. And would you please tell me why you so hate one another? So I asked the environmental, why do you hate? The well, these guys are taking top predators and putting them in nets, in cages, near shore, like, like we do with cattle where you just pack them in and all the waste is polluting. And, and it's, des you know, it's de destroying the environment. Uh, and, and I said, well, that's a good point. So then I turned to the environmentalist, I mean, the, the aquaculture person, and they said, well, there's, a, there's a, the Villela project. What it does is it takes a fish that we eat in our sushi restaurant, it's called hamachi, kapachi, it's got a bunch of yellowtail sushi. If you go into the restaurant and, and you order yellowtail sushi, it is a reef predator fish. Okay, it sells for $17.50 a pound wholesale. This guy, Neil Sims, took that predator fish and had a conversation with it. It said, <laughs> here's, here's what we're gonna do, kid. We're gonna put you not in the coral reefs where you grow up. We're going to take you out into the open ocean where the water depth is 12,000 feet in the tropics where there isn't a whole lot of nutrients, where you'd starve to death. We're going to put you in a cage. We're going to put you down 90 feet so people don't run over you. They don't see you. And we're going to feed you soybean. And either you eat the soybean and become a herbivore or you die. Believe it or not, that fish had a big enough brain to go, got it. And it flipped from being a carnivore to a herbivore, and it's scalable in astronomical scales. We need to be moving away from eating top predators. We eat on land, we eat animals that eat grass. They eat right down at the base of the food chain. Whereas when you're eating a top predator, you're going through different trophic levels and each one of them is an inefficiency of protein production. So there are solutions, but we need to then move away from hunter and gathering and become farmers and herders. But before you can do that, which is why we're doing what we call the Lois and Clark expedition, you have to first know what you got. Right. And that's what will follow. And they're now having a new term for it called the blue economy. When, when, when Jefferson cut the deal with Napoleon, when Napoleon picked a fight with England and lost, England asked him to, no, no, demanded he pay a war debt of $21 million. He came to Jefferson and offered to sell the Louisiana Purchase. By the way, Congress was opposed to it. The business sector was opposed. Why do we want all this land out there? It doesn't produce cotton. And, and you know, all the economic indicators were not dependent upon it. And Jefferson went ahead. And when he acquired the Louisiana Purchase, he doubled the size of America. And look what followed. The entire economy of our nation changed as a result of this acquisition. And when President Reagan picked up a pen and for the price of a pen signed the exclusive economic zone, he did what Jefferson did. He doubled our country. We're now exploring that new 50% and watch our economy shift. So two things. One is, um, I, I just want to ask this follow-up question. So if we're feeding the predator soybean, we still have a food production problem. Could yeah, you, but they're that, flipping it now to feeding it open ocean algae. Yeah. They're flipping off soybean 
because we're running out of farmland. Right. Uh, you know, where, where our land is, we keep replacing farmland with houses and our farmland is going down. Our population is going up. No, they're now flipping it over where they're feeding them marine algae and the, and the fish is eating it. And I actually had them FedEx me some and I had a taste off with ones I got in the local restaurant. No one could tell the difference. And, and, and um, Bob, the, what was the act that Reagan signed? It was called the uh, Law of the Sea Convention. It was the when all nations declared uh, 200 nautical miles from their shores, and it's called the Exclusive Economic Zone, or EEZ. We own that real estate. And uh, we own a lot of coastline. Think about it, from Canada all the way down to Florida, into the Gulf of Mexico, to Mexico, from Alaska, both sides in the Arctic and, and into the Pacific, and then pick it up again, uh, where our ship is right now, take it all the way down to the Mexican border, and then look at all the territorial lands we own in the Pacific, the Hawaiian Islands, the, the Marianne. I mean, there's so many rocks out there that America owns. When you run 200 miles around them, you pick up 50% of our nation. It's a vast mm. amount of real estate. I, I don't think I ever um, quite understood the impact of that. Just go to Google and type US EEZ image. And, All right. And that's where do we're it. living. Yep, that's it. Now, this is a memoir you wrote. And um, <laughs> so I do want to spend a couple of minutes on the memoir part. And, you know, you, you will be 80 next year. I don't know if you knew that. Um, <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm reminding myself hourly. <laughs> and, and was it uh, the prospect of uh, your being older that motivated? I mean, you've written 20-something books. What was it that motivated you at this moment to say, I want this to be a memoir, not another scientific or discovery book? If you want to know the truth, it was the review by the New York Times when I wrote Eternal Darkness with Prince to Press, and they said, great book, didn't learn a thing about it, the author. And mm. I, I felt, I just felt, I don't know what caused me, because it's when you really open up your life, it's, you know, no one's perfect, and, and, and you're not sure you want everyone in the world to know every detail. But I, I felt it was time. And... Uh, because I knew I was going to launch this new project that was going to take me to 90, okay, if I get there, with a new mapping program. So I knew I had amazing uh, follow-on to it, but I had 157 expeditions that hadn't been woven into a fabric of, uh, that I did with the book. And I got to thank National Geographic's team and, and Chris Drew and his wonderful wife, uh, Annette, uh, who PhD in journalism from Princeton and uh, Drew, uh, Drew Lewis, uh, 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 Chris Drew wrote the seminal book, Blind Man's Bluff, which if you're into warfare and how we won the, uh, uh, the Cold War, you want to read that book. Uh, so I knew him, School of Journalism, investigative reporter from the New York Times. They put a team of about 12 people on me that picked me apart. And uh, fortunately, I have amazing archives. And I, I must say, the pandemic gave me the time. Yeah. I, I haven't been on the Nautilus now for almost two years. Uh, still just last week, but I had a lot of time to do it, and I was able to pour a lot of energy into it. And uh, what'd you learn about yourself, Bob, that surprised you in in the process? Well, you know, this whole discovery of my dyslexia, I had sort of just you know, didn't pay a whole lot of attention. First place, I didn't know I was dyslexic. My mom, when I struggled with reading just said, well, you miss phonics when we moved from Kansas. And I just accept, okay, well. Okay, good. <laughs> okay, I guess I'll just read twice as long. So I, I developed amazing coping skills on how to overcome being a slow reader. Uh, and I also learned how to memorize things. When I couldn't spell, I, I would memorize what the word looked like. Mm -hmm. you know, I couldn't decode it, but I knew when I got it right, I had it right. I also developed lots of synonyms and anonyms when I couldn't get the word I wanted. I could get one close to it. So I learned all these scoping, coping skills. And then I became this sort of 
Uh, jack of all trades, master of none. I quadruple majored in college. I did math, physics, chemistry, and geology. I went into the military. I went into student government. I played athletics. I just did this lateral because I had a brilliant, brilliant older brother who wasn't dyslexic, who smartest human being I ever Richard. met. Richard. Right, Richard. And he just iced through it, you know, straight A, Phi Beta Kappa, particle physics under Edward Teller at Berkeley. You don't get much smarter than that. And then I would follow him two years later and they say, oh, you're Richard's brother. You must be, well, no, you're not. And so I was made to feel stupid when I knew I wasn't stupid. And I just doubled up to prove them wrong. It was more of, I'm going to prove that I'm not stupid. So I just took it on and I put all this energy. And fortunately, I'm, you know, as you notice, a little ADHD, uh, but I learned how to manage my energy and how to manage my enthusiasm. I, right over, I'm staring just off camera at a big puzzle board. And my wife, gets me these thousand piece puzzles and she covers up the covers. So I don't know what the puzzle is. And then, you know, my wife, Barbara. So here's what she did. Imagine she got a thousand piece puzzle where they had no borders to it. They removed the borders. There was no border, which is the first thing you do. There were holes in the puzzle that couldn't be filled. And there were pieces to the puzzle that were worthless and didn't go anywhere. And then the coup de gras was every piece was the same shade of blue. And I did it. Okay. <laughs> because that's how I calm down. I get huh. so energized and I get up from my work and I walk right over there and I do some puzzles and my whole calm down. I just have to need to know to get back. I try to do 30 minutes of thinking and writing and then 10 minutes of a puzzle, but I can sustain that rhythm indefinitely. And Bob, is that um, common that ADHD is, is paired bed, with dyslexia? Very common, very common bedmates is uh, ADHD and, and, and dyslexia. Yes, it's, it's, but the, the real researchers are right there, Sally uh, Shaywitz at, at, at Yale. And, and then as you know, on the book, two wonderful, for researchers who wrote the book, The Dyslexic Advantage, Brock and, uh, and uh, Fernetta Eide, uh, who wrote, when I heard on, heard, remember, not read, when I heard the interview they did of those authors on NPR, uh, I never heard the word dyslexia and advantage in the same side by side. Yeah. And I got the book from Amazon, took me all night, and I read it and I cried because it explained me to me for the yeah. first time. I knew I was different. I thought I was alone. And then I realized 20% of us are dyslexic. And that's a big part of our population. And most people won't admit it. Most people don't see it as a gift like I do. Uh, but when you make rattle off all the lists of people, who are successful, just like Richard Branson, okay, uh, Ted Turner, Steven Spielberg, uh, Einstein, the list is always white men. Mm. And I'm thinking, what about the 20% that aren't white men? Yeah. And then you look at some staggering statistics. The percentage of people of color with dyslexia that drop out of high school is huge. 35% drop out of high school. Uh, we're all entrepreneurs, but they go into the wrong entrepreneuring. 65% of the prison population. I mean, you know, it costs more wow. to send someone to, to prison than to Harvard. I'm now on this bent that I, and why I'm talking so openly about dyslexia is I want to reach those people that want to, not end up in prison, not drop out of school and be able to manage it uh, as a gift. And uh, so I'm very into it now. I'm you know, I, I love that. No, my son is dyslexic and, you know, he's 31. So schools, some schools were beginning to pick up on it, but, it, you know, a lot of disadvantaged kids, those schools and teachers are not. And, you know, Sally Shaywitz, as you said, and is doing, you know, an enormous amount. 
to, to show that our brains are physically different. That's what's yeah. important. We have our neuron spacings is much wider. Our, fa- uh, our firing mechanisms are different, but there are pathways where you have outperformed. I love this, where you out- outperform, where it is a gift and an advantage and it's in the visual world. And I work in a world of total darkness Mm. and I'm not lost down there. I'm able to take the screens on my computers. If you, when we show you in a minute, we'll take you into my command center. I'm looking at it right now. Nothing but displays, uh, 40 some displays. I'm able to take it all in, form an image and I know where I am in total darkness. Mm. And, and And you wouldn't believe the percentage of dyslexics on my team. Interesting. So speaking of total darkness, um, one of the um, passages in the book, you talk about um, the horrific and tragic loss um, of your son, Todd, uh, in a car accident. And share with us how that might have changed your life, your sense of uh, adventure, or how you wanted to spend your life? I mean, that's the worst loss I think any of us can experience. Well, let me see if I can get through this, because it's not easy to get through it. It was, he, we had just been to sea. We had just discovered the Bismarck. He was with me on that moment of discovery. Not easy. Yeah. Uh, (laughs) I'm working on it. And we then went to National Geographic. We did this amazing press conference. I went on a trip and he was dead days later, just before he was 21. That rite of passage we just almost made. Yeah, it is devastating. And you're not the same person. Mm. I mean, that was 1989, and here I am. I mean, he's he's that close all the time. Yeah, it's it's you don't go back to where you were. Yeah. And the last thing he talked about on camera, if you saw the TV show, and I had never looked at that footage. I could not look at that footage. But when they made the TV show, there it was. And he said, I want to help dad reach other kids. The Jason Project is his greatest thing he ever did. And that's why I committed myself to not only dyslexic kids, but all kids and kids that are his age. And then he's never gone. Yeah. And and share with us what the Jason Project is, because it's pretty damn cool. Well, it was, really, it was sort of ironic because when I came back from finding the Titanic, Woods Hall was not happy with me. Everyone was upset that I was not supposed to do something like that in an academic. I caught so much flack for finding the Titanic uh, from academicians. That's not what academicians are supposed to do. That's you know grandstanding and all of that. And the mail room was inundated the phone was ringing off the wall and so the mail room simply took the let i got sixteen thousand letters from children within the days of finding the titanic and they just dumped them on my desk and my desk disappeared under a, a mountain of letters and i began reading them slowly and they all said <laughs> the same, they all said the same thing what do I have to do to do what you do? They saw back then my robot that went inside the Titanic, Jason, JJ as R2-D2, but it was a real robot. It wasn't fake. And they saw this robotic future even back then in 19, uh, 1985. And then they said, next time you go, can I go with you? Mm. And here I was developing this technology to move your spirit. And so I decided that I would stop every year 
and do an expedition just for kids and take them to some amazing place on the planet. And that was before internet. Well, now with the internet, I, 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 the Jason projects I'm no longer doing, but I'm doing it now, uh, Jason on hormones, because when we did the Jason project, we would, we would do a two week expedition where we pretty well was defined here with the Nautilus. You go to nautiluslive.org. We're, we're boldly going where no one has gone before on planet earth. And you're with us the whole time. I love middle school children. I never want to leave middle school. They are born curious. Uh, their first question is why? And then when you try to answer it, they hit you with, but why? And then by the third one, they've exhausted everything you know within three whys. And I found that my job as a dyslexic was to survive the educational experience and not have that little pilot light of curiosity snuffed out by a process that was snuffing us out. And so I'm committed to, I reach all kids, but I know I'm a little partial to that 20%. And that's what I do. I Watch us. We will be doing broadcasts all through the program. We do, we do hundreds and hundreds of live broadcasts from our studios aboard the ship right into classrooms. If you want us to come into your classroom, let us know. It's a piece of cake for us to do it. And we do it 24-7. So, yeah, that's... That's where I'm. Where I am every Thursday. I have a, a place at my headquarters in New London, uh, where I have what's called the Looking Glass. And you remember Alison in Wonderland? Yes. There's a wonderful story in the. I think it was in the Globe today or yesterday. Yesterday was a lovely story in the Globe about a reporter who came to my Looking Glass. And every Thursday, I go to my Looking Glass. And I go to schools all over the United States and I have so much fun with kids. Yeah. It's a lot of fun. Bob, you know, one of the things you say in the epilogue uh, for the book, that was one of the things that I found to sound seem untrue uh, that I want to ask you about. You said that um, Arthur Brooks talked about the, uh, a, a way to age and that one of the things you should do between 75 <laughs> and 80 is say no. Yeah. Now, you, in the book, you suggest that you might think about no. Is it, it, th that doesn't really sound real to me. Well, here's, here's a way of, uh, you know, this is wordsmithing. As you know, he said three things. One is he was standing next to a sequoia tree and he says, how does a sequoia tree 300 feet tall with roots that only go six feet down, not fall over. And it sends out the roots and grabs onto the trees next to him. And that's called bonding, developing relationships. I spent today out in Long Island Sound with one of my best friends fishing. So I know how to get away and I got away. Uh, so I do that. The other one is to mentor. And I have five worlds. I have a military world, I have an academic world, I have a technology world, I have a National Geographic world, I have the whole, my, my wife's production company, I have five worlds. And I've now, as of January, have someone running all five, each of those five worlds. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I, uh, they say, you never call me. And I said, I only call you when you when you screw up and you're not screwing up. So as long as you're doing great, you'll never get a phone call from me. And so I'm doing that. That's the third one. When something comes along next time, say no. Well, here's my definition of no. Does no involve, yes right now, is involving about 300 people that I'm taking care of. Mm. I am feeding and taking care of 300 wonderful men and women. The full spectrum of America is on my team. I, I've got every conceivable shade of America, every flavor, everyone you can have, because we're only going to get where we're going to get when we're for less than 5% of the planet is we need to involve everyone in the game. So, I have all these people, it takes a lot of money. I'm now dreaming up a project that doesn't require 
a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And in fact, when we were writing the final end of the book, Chris said, so what are you going to do? What are you going to do next? And I said, I'm going to become Captain Nemo's father. <laughs> and he said, well, what do you mean? Uh, did Captain Nemo have a father? Well, you became Captain Nemo. Your, success, your ship's the Nautilus. Uh, you are Captain Nemo, but I didn't know he had a father. And I said, yes, his name was Jules Verne. Mm. And I'm working on an amazing novel right now called the, uh, the Island of Tranquility. And it's a novel. I did one years ago called uh, Bright Shark, which did well. But uh, I now... This one's science fiction, right? Science with a stretch. When I worked, when I did the TV series with Steven Spielberg called Sequest DSV, and with Roy Scheider, who was captain of the, of the Sequest. And what the rules with, with the Spielberg was stretch the truth, don't break it. And so I was responsible for making sure every script stretched but didn't break the laws of physics. And so that's what I'm doing. I'm, I, I, I think because my background is so heavily based in physics and mathematics and, and the physical sciences, I dream in real context. The dreams I have are possible. Mm. And so what I'm doing now is I've always picked goals that took me 15 years to accomplish. In the book, you'll see three cycles of 15, going in four, fourth year, 60 years in three 15 year cycles. I don't have another 15 years. So I'm dreaming up what could be mm -hmm. and trying to plant that seed into the next generation. You know, there's a wonder, my grandmother who was from Kansas, uh, a, a wonderful woman said, have little sayings. She had little sayings. I'm working on, I'll tell you another book I'm doing based upon my grandma. And my grandma, uh, like I said, oh, like all my previous family members didn't go to college. She had sayings. And one of her favorite saying was, great is the person who plants a tree knowing they will never sit in its shade. Mm. And that is greatness, she said to me. And so, as we know, every generation stands on the shoulders of the next of the previous generation and sees new horizons. And I'm hoping to provide some dreams like Nemo did, like Jules Verne did for me, because a lot of what he said was science fiction turned out not to be. Right. And 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 so I wanted to see, I see a vision of the future. Uh, but I won't be there, but maybe I can inspire people to go there. So yeah, that's, that's a project and that doesn't take 300 people. Yeah. So Bob, um, it, what we've been uh, talking with Bob Ballard, uh, the author of Into the Deep, a memoir from the man who found Titanic. And, and Bob, I, you know, I was going to close with um, some of what you uh, just suggested that, you know, reading your book and thinking about the life that you've led and the life that you're leading, um, I think is reminding all of us that there are new frontiers. Uh, as you say, there are 3.4 million more shipwrecks um, that can be discovered. But the idea that um, you're creating the sense of possibility that it, it you know, your work on uh, the Jason project, your work on going into classrooms, your looking glass project, the work you do as Captain Nemo on the Nautilus, you know, I just picture more little eight or nine year old kids out there thinking, oh, you know, I heard Bob Ballard speak, or I read his new science fiction book uh, that's coming out, and I think I too want to be an explorer. And I think having more explorers like you has got to be good for the future of our planet, the land and the water. So thank you so much for what you're doing. Thanks for uh, taking uh, the time to speak with us. Well, thank you. And remember Walt Disney, who was dyslexic, 
uh, said, if you can dream it, you can do it. All right. Thank you, Bob. Um, So for those of you that are on, the podcast obviously ended. um, And Bob has a very cool screen to the left of him. Obviously, we didn't do that on the podcast because you couldn't see it. So, Bob, if you would uh, show us that screen and explain for everyone uh, that's on the event what that is and how they can access it. Well, let's go to that right now. I think you can call it up on the screen. I'll walk you through it. But right now, my ship of exploration, the EV Nautilus hit quad. Okay, right now, that's a live image coming in from the Nautilus. We just pulled into port. Uh, We're in the Pacific Ocean. You'll see a little map down there, just north of Portland and south of Seattle at a place called Astoria. And we're, what you're seeing on the screen is just some previous images we just collected, but the, you'll see that we're actually up against a dock. But when we sail, I think it's tomorrow or day after tomorrow, we'll be heading out to sea. And you can go to this site called Nautilus Live. Dot org. So Nautilus Live, all one word, dot org. And you'll notice that there's a spot there where it says, ask a question. So this is a program that will run 24 hours a day. So if you're having trouble with insomnia, just tune in and we'll put you to sleep. No, not really. And we are boldly going where no one has gone before on planet Earth. That's what's so cool about this expedition. We are going where no one has ever been. So people always say, what are you going to discover? Well, whatever there is. Uh, Kids say, what's your greatest discovery? And I always like to say the one we're about to make. But this entire command center, look at that crazy. I go in there and it's like eating candy. I know exactly where I am and where I want to go. And these are just some highlight videos that I asked the team to stream uh, so you could see what kinds of things we do. But if you go to this site, you can not only see us live, ask questions. Most importantly, you want to look at who's on watch and how did they get there? They, every, I I typically have about 50 people on the ship at any one time. I'll rotate 300 and some people through the ship and they all profile how they got there. And everyone has a different story on how they got on the Nautilus and got into that seat. And it could be, uh, we not only do STEM, I love STEM, but I also love STEAM. And I make sure that we're, we have artists, we have authors, we have production people constantly weaving and, and doing the storytelling that's behind the science. And we have a beautiful pr- production center on the ship that goes into classrooms. So go to the site, enjoy it. It'll be up and running. I'll be in that room in the latter part of September. And then I'll be back in that room almost the whole month of December leading right up to the 20th of December when I'm in off of Kauai, exploring the largest marine monument of, of America. So join us on our explorations and uh, tune in. Thank you, Bob. And uh, I'm sorry. Thank you, everybody, uh, for joining us. I know a handful of you had questions that uh, we've run out of time. Hopefully, uh, we've ended up covering a lot of it. And, you know, a reminder to get the book. Uh, and most importantly, a reminder to read the book. Uh, because well, let's have a get together. When are you going to do these in person? I always enjoyed going across the street to the to the library. Uh, we got to do one of them. Well, I'm hoping this fall. Well, when you come back, Bob, because you're going right. to be on the ship, right? Yeah. So maybe early next year, I think we'll be ready to be doing live events. You stay safe out there. <laughs> well, I'm double vaccinated. I was what, the first in line, I think. All right. Thank you all for joining us, Bob. Thank you so much. Say hi to Barbara. I definitely will. We're going to have a glass of wine, right? Okay, great. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.